Well, welcome everyone. I'm gonna take just a minute or second here or two while we get everyone's connections up and going. It looks like we've got uh, a lot of attendees coming online. So I'm gonna give this just a couple more seconds before we start the program. Yeah, very good. Okay, so welcome everyone to the second Ridge uh, Coronavirus Shelter in Place Virtual Winemaker Tasting and Roundtable. Um, we did our first one last week and I think it went pretty well for our first attempt. So here we are back at it again. Uh, my name is Mark Vernon. I'm the CEO here at Ridge Vineyards and uh, we're hosting these virtual tastings and uh, winemaker panels every Thursday afternoon at the same time, starting at four o'clock. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in what we're gonna be doing in the next few couple of these, you can always go to our website. Uh, we have them all listed and the contents of each one of these is right there uh, on the website. So you can also go there when this particular seminar is completed, you can go there and, and register and sign up for the one next week if you want to come back and see another one. So I think uh, today I'd like to get started by introducing uh, the members of our panel. Uh, so first is uh, Eric Baher, who's our Chief Operating Officer and Head Winemaker for the Montebello Winery. So Eric, say hi. Hi, hi. hi. <laughs> Sorry. And then we also have David Gates, who's our Senior Vice President of Vineyard Operations. Hey, Dave. Hello. Okay, and uh, Eric is actually coming to you from the Montebello Winery, and I think Dave is at his home, which is actually perched right in the middle of the vineyard, so he can watch his lovely vines out there uh, <laughs> as they're continuing to grow, or I guess bud out at this point in time. Yeah, trying, right? trying to wake up. Yeah, yeah, trying to wake up from their winter sleep. So, um, a couple, before we start the tasting, i just give you a quick update on Ridge. For those of you who were in, tuned in last week, you know that uh, uh, Ridge is classified as an essential business for our shelter-in-place orders, which means we are allowed to continue operations. However, we must do that in a responsible way to minimize any potential uh, spread of the virus. What that means is the vast majority of our staff is now working at home. Um, the people that need to come to work uh, are, are vineyard workers, but they're all working at least six feet apart from each other out in the vineyards. Um, our winery crew, it's the same thing. And as well as our warehouse crew, we've actually split our warehouse operations into two shifts so that we can provide more space between the employees to ensure their safety. So, so far uh, we've been doing this for two weeks and I think we're starting to get the hang of it and get the rhythm and uh, we're able to pretty much keep our, our, our operations uh, going. Uh, uh, we've, uh, we've also paid a lot of attention to sanitation and making sure that we follow all the guidelines as far as that's concerned to guarantee the safety, both of you, our customers and our employees, which is really important for us. So um, the good news is nobody at Ridge has gotten sick um, and we hope to keep it that way. Uh, so uh, I think now, uh, we can turn our attention to the wines that we're going to be tasting today. Let me explain a little bit about how the uh, online uh, tasting is going to work. Um, so if you have a question that you'd like to ask our panelists, please use the question and answer function for Zoom. You'll see that down at the bottom of the screen. You can click on that and that'll open up a dialog box where you can type in your questions. Um, I'll try to pick up some of those questions and ask them live to the panelists. Others uh, might get answered by text, depending on how much time we have and the nature of the questions. You're also free to use the chat function, which I can see a number of people are already doing. Um, it's a little harder for us to pick questions out of the chat. So if you have questions, put those into the question and answer box, uh, but also feel free to comment uh, in, in the chat as well. Um, okay. So that's kind of how this is going to work. Uh, we had a pretty lively audience last week. We had a lot of really good questions. I think that is part of what makes this experience uh, uh, the most interesting that it can be, is if you uh, participate. So we encourage you all to do that. Um, okay, so the wines for today that we're going to focus on 
are the wines that have just recently been released. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are members of our uh, collector program, you will have received, uh, if you're uh, getting the estate option, the two estate wines that we're gonna taste today. And then you're probably also familiar with what we call our historic vineyard series of wines. And I'm gonna let Eric talk more about that. So two of our wines today are historic vineyard series wines and two of them are estate wines. And with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Eric and let you yeah. start with uh, telling us about the estate Chardonnay. Yeah, yeah, so uh, this is our 2018 vintage. It's a, a drier year here on the mountain. So with that, the grapes arrived with really good concentration, uh, intense flavor. It was the perfect ingredients to work with in uh, making this wine. I, we didn't get much yield. I mean, we never get much yield here in this site, but um, we're rewarded every year with, with grapes that really can make such powerful Chardonnay. So as we pick, I mean, before we pick, we're in the vineyard often sampling the grapes, tasting, trying to find the grapes at that moment where the flavors have really peaked. And then David and team will, will hand pick and we'll bring the fruit up in gondolas to the winery. And from there, uh, we'll load a press and then gently with our pneumatic press, which is extremely gentle, gently squeeze the juice out. It takes about a two hour process to process about four tons worth of grapes. And with that, we can taste as it's applying more and more pressure to find the moment where we want to cut off and, and get the, the best quality juice out of the press cycle. And then that day's batch will sit and tank overnight and we'll just let it rest. And I'll put cooling on the tank so that we can bring the juice temperature down to about 55 Fahrenheit. The next day, we'll pump the juice over in that tank and, and make sure that all the, the leaves, all the sediment has been thoroughly mixed up and that you know, the nutrients are, are totally homogenized. So as we barrel down, every barrel is gonna be filled with the, the same juice. So where we carry out the fermentations in the old part of the winery, so where uh, Dr. Peroni had built his cellar in the 1880s, that's where we have our Chardonnay barrels stacked that's where the juice comes. We'll put about 45 to 50 gallons in a 60 gallon barrel. And in that space, which is below ground, it, it stays earth temperature. And, and there the yeast will generally take about two weeks to start the fermentation. And as they do, it's a real gradual, slow moving ferment. It takes about three months for the lots to go dry. And once they're dry, then, then the fermentation is complete enough where we can safely top up all the barrels. And if we tried to fill the barrels initially with 60 gallons in, six, in a 60 gallon barrel, as the yeasts are fermenting, it would end up frothing over and would end up losing quite a bit of volume. So we always underfill for primary ferment, but once it's dry, it's safe to then top up the barrel completely. And then it's a matter of just waiting for malolactic, which, because our Chardonnay has such firm acid, the pH is so low, that can sometimes hinder the, the progress of the malolactic. It can usually take you know, uh, six months before that part of the process is complete. But once it, it's done, and, and it's done with natural, the natural malolactic bacteria that have acclimated to the, the high acidity condition of the Chardonnay, you know, they, they will complete. Um, and it's usually in the summer months when the cellar temperature is warm enough that they have a better chance of surviving and, and fermenting. Once that's done, then we can do a tasting. And for the estate bottling, I'm, I'm looking for fruit. You know, this wine here has so much of it. So we're going for fruit intensity, elegance on the palate, nice oily texture, but, but real good drinkability. And I think we've achieved that with the 18. So when you can, Eric, contrast that a little bit with how, what you're looking for when you make the Montebello Chardonnay. Yeah, so the Montebello, I mean, I'm tasting these lots all through their life in the cellar, every single barrel. Uh, what I'm looking for in the Montebello are those lots that really just, the flavor is just superb, intense, and, and really showing great limestone minerality. 
that really reflects the, the terroir we have at Montebello. And, and those lots tend to have even higher acid. You know, they'll come together nicely, those groups of barrels to make a Chardonnay that has really long bottle life potential. Whereas the estate, it's, it's about fruit, about elegance, drinkability, you know, it will age as well, but you know, it, it's gotta be delicious right at release. And if you wait a year or two to open a bottle, it's just gonna be better. But we're not expecting this, this wine to go on 20 years, whereas the Montebello Chardonnay, it just gets better even when it's reached 20 years of age. Mm. Yeah, and so once it's assembled, then it's a matter of just letting gravity clarify it. Uh, we don't filter our Chardonnay, so, and, and we don't find, so we're not using bentonite or isinglass or any of the other fining compounds to help with the clarification. It's really just relying on the moon. So racking the wine as the moon is in that cycle where we actually see king tides in the San Francisco Bay. That's when we know the moon has moved close to the earth, it's giving us that really good gravitational pull. That's the moment we decant off from the barrel and uh, schedule bottling. Great. So Eric, there's some questions about malolactic. And I think part of that is because there are some people who make uh, Chardonnay who like to talk about the fact that they don't do malolactic. Oh yeah, I know and, some of those producers. Yeah, and I think yeah. in, a, in a number of cases, that's probably because they've gotten their fruit quite ripe. They don't have much acid to begin with. And you can talk a little bit about what doing what malolactic does in terms of acid and the fact that our wines have so much natural acidity. Yeah, I, you know, the purpose of, of inhibiting malolactic, I've heard many different debates about that. One is like malolactic clouds your terroir. So if you let malolactic occur, it may actually take away from some of the vineyard character. And that's a reason why not to let it happen. That I totally don't believe in. Uh, the other, of course, is if you have a low acid site, you absolutely would not want your malolactic to complete because there goes away so much of your acid because the malolactic bacteria are, are actively converting one of the main acids of the grape, which is malate. It's converting it to lactic acid, which precipitates out of the wine. So effectively it's, it's raising the pH of, of the wine, lowering the acid and, and making it even less defined, less you know, interesting. Um, high pH Chardonnays really are kind of flabby and kind of, they lack liveliness. So, so a winemaker would be forced to input some acidity to, to increase the acidity. And often what's chosen is citric acid or tartaric acid if they're willing to spend the extra money. And that will have an effect of making the wine more lively. But when you Adding acid that way, it, it never integrates nicely into the wine. You can always, you always feel a wine that has been artificially acidified because it, it makes it taste um, really like uh, sweet tart, you know, really strong, sharp acid that's not totally integrated into the flavors. Great. Okay. Um, so do you have a sense in terms of this particular 2017 vintage, how you might compare this, well, this Chardonnay? 20, 2018. I'm sorry, 2018. Yeah, so. 20, 2018 vintage of the Chardonnay to other previous oh, vintages. Oh man, I, you know, I, I love every vintage of Chardonnay we make. Um, 18, from the very beginning, the fruit, the flavor of the juice going into barrel, I could just tell was going to make a really phenomenal uh, quality vintage. Um, even just like tasting the wine as it was fermenting, going through malactic, it's just all the signs were pointing to just this being really one of my favorite years. And in bottle now, it, it really it reminds me of some of our great vintages like 2001, 2002. You know, the, the pear quality of fruit is really well defined. It's got some tropical notes. It drinks super round and, you know, it's got, it's got a lot of nice texture to the wine. Great. So there's a couple of questions, Dave, I think you can jump in on here. Uh, one is uh, there, there's been some questions. If you could talk a little bit about our organic farming practices, sustainability, uh, et cetera. And then also there is a question about, well, 
you know, how come we aren't, uh, you know, growing, um, uh, you know, uh, or, or plant, planting and growing any Sauvignon Blanc or essentially ah. Bordeaux, Bordeaux Blanc since we're growing other Bordeaux varietals at Montebello. But I think that one, I, I'll answer a little bit and then you, you straighten me out and then talk about organics. But one of the things we, the vineyards at Montebello are mountain vineyards and they all have different slopes and aspects. They face different directions. And one of the things we do with the, we use the Chardonnay for is to plant vineyard in places that are maybe north facing or don't have as much sun exposure as we get for the red Bordeaux varietal. So <clears throat> it really helps us uh, with a variety, a variety that's better adapted to the cooler parts of Montebello and lets us make a really great wine from those areas. So Dave, why don't you jump in and straighten me out or amplify what we're <laughs> saying here and then talk about the organics. Yeah, um, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, so Montebello, on the lower stretches of Montebello, uh, there's an inversion layer that kind of sits in up, off the bay. And that inversion layer mimics, um, well, it's basically a little bit cooler in the summer so that um, as the bay and the valley heats up, it sucks in cold weather, cold uh, currents of um, from the from the currents off the coast of California, bringing fog with it, that settles over the valley at night. Well, it sits right, the very edge of that layer sits right about 17 or 1800 feet, most which is where our major blocks of Chardonnay are planted. And so that keeps them fresh and cool. So it's actually a little bit different climate than what we see up above that inversion layer, which is warmer nights and cooler days. It's funny because it's, it's actually spring happens earlier, lower on the mountain, but then the summers are a little bit modulated by that. They get warm during the day, but it's that coolness at night I think that helps. Also, um, the Chardonnay comes in pretty early for us and we have to really jump on picking it. So it is on the warm side for Chardonnay, but the limestone in the soil and the, the fact that it's more of an east and north aspect for most of the blocks of Chardonnay helps keep that acidity. And that, that acidity that we see in, in this uh, Chardonnay is really a hallmark of the Santa Cruz Mountains. It's a really great place for Chardonnay. It has all the California sunshine you want on the fruit, but it keeps that great acidity so it, it, you can get these really ripe kind of opulent flavors of some vintages, but still cleans your palate with a, with a nice acidity on the, on the finish. So, so organic um, yeah. and sustainability, you know, there are lots of, lots of buzzword, uh, buzzwords around um, organics, regenerative organics. I, I like to say regener regenerative sustainability. Um, sustainability is more kind of a mindset. Um, organics is a set of rules that you follow farming wise that make sure that you are only using certified organic um, products in the, in the wine or in the grape growing process and which most of those are have been around for a long time um, you know weed control is mostly done by tillage for uh, with organics there's a, a new organic herbicide that seems to have some promise that we're in, interested in um, for the, the main issue that we have in California to deal with because we have such a great climate to grow grapes is powdery mildew which you get on roses it, it shows up on roses all the time we don't have a lot of other really nasty mildews that they have in the east coast or in Europe um, we just have downy or powdery mildew so that um, there are a couple products that work really well with that have been around forever uh, sulfur is the main one that we use um, and and that's um, completely organic so you just have to spray a little bit more often with organics because the, the protection interval is less than if you use some of the systemics that are that the conventional growers use. But the great thing about uh, sulfur or oils or um, some of the biologicals uh, control agents that we use is there's no resistance uh, buildup in the mildew population, kind of like um, what happens with um, staph infections or bacteria infections in humans or animals. Um, when you use antibiotics or, or fungicides in grapes uh, or other uh, crops, often the same chemistry year after year, season after season, the, the um, pathogen, pathogen that you're trying to control develops resistance to it. And we're seeing that 
throughout the West Coast um, in, in conventional vineyards. And it's funny because um, our, our, this is not, not at Montebello, but in at Geyserville at our Witten Ranch. Last year, they were really talking a lot about um, bunches, fungicide resistance and mildew spores. So we, tra we had a, our company, a company came in and trapped a bunch of mildew spores in Witten Ranch, which has been organically farmed since 2008 with absolutely no synthetic fungicide spread on them. And yet every, that you could find every single spore, uh, every single uh, fungal resistant spore that's out there. there so there are a bunch of different um, chemicals that, that have been used for fungicides. And there are about three of them that are, that mildew has uh, developed resistance to. And those three mildews were in that vineyard, even though it was totally organic, which is the problem with, with um, you know, having conventional material that wasn't quite researched maybe or anyway it, it just under, to me it underscores you know some of the organic products are, are actually probably better because they're known to work for, for a couple well a century and a half anyway I hope that answered your question Mark uh -huh. good no thanks Dave that's great Okay, I think it's probably time to move on to the next wine. So Eric, maybe yeah, yeah. Talk so about this the Merlot. Is Merlot. So Ridge planted the first block of Merlot in 1968 at the top, just above here, 2,700 foot elevation. It started to show up in the uh, blend of Montebello in 1974, and they actually did a small little bottling uh, of Montebello Merlot that same year, which was beautiful. I actually had the chance to taste. With one of our collectors who had had the two in the in his cellar had the 74 Montebello the 74 Merlot Montebello and it was like left bank right bank I mean just beautiful wines and, and with that it, it kind of just pr proved the, the importance of having some Merlot growing here at this site for its usefulness and how it, it blends together and really stitches nicely together with Cabernet it kind of brings elegance to the overall blend because it's not as tannic. You know, Cab has got the backbone, it's got the structure, it's got the dark fruit. Merlot brings in more flesh, higher tone quality of fruit, and it just makes the wine, the overall blend, so much more sensuous and, and wonderful. So here we, we actually have it as 100%. This is from the Peroni parcel right here at the top of the mountain. It's not the oldest block that was used to make this. It's, it's a block right across from it. Uh, planted 1993, and it has often gone into the Montebello. But we, we held out this year 10 and a half barrels to, to do the separate small little bottling so people could taste the wonderful quality of Merlot growing here at the highest point of the mountain where, you know, you've got topsoil that's eroded over, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. And so the vines are deeply embedded in that limestone. And so you really can get a strong imprint of the Montebello character in this glass. And you can immediately smell it. It's kind of that wet stone along with the bramble fruit. And the wonderful thing about growing it at this higher elevation is we are above the summer fog. You know, we get the summer inversion. That extra warmth helps, helps with ripening the grapes. But it also, as we're into the season of harvest, the temperature inversion goes away and then it, it starts to dip. We, we see daytime temperatures that are lower, nighttime temperatures even lower, and it has this effect of slowing down the ripening so you can get really deep color developed in the skin, riper seed tannins, and then also really high acid. So this wine came off the vines um, you know, at about 12 and a half alcohol, and yet it's, it's so wonderfully intense and fruity and, and delicious. So it, it's got the intensity of a wine that would be like 14% alcohol. It's just, we can reach that point of physiological ripeness at a lower sugar level to get it off the vine at 12 and a half alcohol and make a real classic uh, Merlot. So one of the one of the questions is where do, where does the Peroni name come from? And I'll just do a, a quick one on that. So the property where the where the Montebello Winery is located, where Eric is sitting right now, was actually originally developed by a Dr. Peroni, who was an a, an Italian immigrant who came to San Francisco as a medical doctor and had a, a pretty successful practice there. 
So, uh, <clears throat> and he had seen the property down at Montebello, it reminded him somewhat of his native Italy and bought a significant amount of land and um, planted the first vineyards there and actually built the, the, the stone winery, which still exists today. And it's really the core of our Montebello uh, winery. We've expanded it uh, and we've modernized it, but the, but the original stone cellars are still there and they're really something if you, if you ever get a chance to see them. But, um, and uh, so we've, we, the historic vineyard series, we've named the wines after the specific piece of vineyard uh, in terms of who the original a uh, uh, person or family was that planted those vineyards. And so at the, our highest elevation where the winery's located, that was all property that was originally owned and planted by Dr. Peroni. Um, then a little lower down the hill uh, or the mountain where we have our tasting room and was actually the first piece of property that the Ridge Partners bought, that, that uh, area, that land was, was originally owned by the Torre family and they planted vineyard and built the wooden barn uh, winery that uh, is still there today and really is the, the core of our, our tasting facility. So um, we go further down the hill and there's a vineyard that was uh, originally planted by Charlie Rooston. And then uh, down at the lowest part of, the, of Montebello is the Klein uh, property, which is now known as Jim Samir, but it was originally developed by a man named Pierre Klein who first planted that vineyard and actually was the first person to plant Cabernet Sauvignon at Montebello. Early plantings of the other vineyards were more typical California varieties, including Zinfandel and many others, uh, but it was really Pierre Klein who was an Alsatian had come and, and, and championed the idea of growing um, Cabernet at Montebello and in fact produced some wines that won gold medals in Paris uh, around the turn of the century, around 1900. So he, he was an early pioneer of Cabernet in California and at the first at Montebello and the first to show that wines of really great quality could be produced uh, in that area. So, um, oh, yeah, so go ahead, Eric. I think, yeah, uh, no, I mean, I was, yeah, the whole idea of the historic vineyard series, as you've mentioned, Mark, was that it's really kind of celebrating the history that we have here at Montebello where this whole mountain was planted to vineyards before the turn of the, the century, the, you know, pre 19th century, these vineyards were planted, the winery, this room that I'm sitting in right here, this is where Peroni was entertaining opera stars of the time. And the, off to the left or the right here is the, the, the laboratory, but it was his kitchen. The cellar goes down 30 feet below me and that's where his wine was made. And uh, you know, these, these families that, that came here at that time really found a perfect place to grow vines and make excellent wine until prohibition was enacted and that unfortunately pretty much closed all the operations during the 13 years of prohibition. But you know we we come back Ridge was kind of the first to start up again in 1959. Uh, the, the founders bought the Tory property, renovated the old barn, and began officially making wine there in 1962, starting with Chardonnay and Cabernet from vines that had been planted in 1949. So they had you know, basically 12-year-old Cabernet vines to work with in making the first vintage of Montebello. And gradually, as they took over the, the mountain and started planting more parcels, they were beginning to include other things like the franc, uh, at the top here in 1972, the Merlot, 1968, and then eventually some Petit Verdot joined the, the mix in the, the 80s. And so, you know, we created a more of a classic mix vineyard at Montebello and have over our time just been able to acquire more and more land. So some, some of the recent acquisition is, is something that Mark and, and David Gates and Paul Draper have been working on for a very long time. And that was some of the old abandoned land of Peroni's Vineyard, which we were able to reacquire. And, and that's where we're beginning to do some plantings today. But in that mix, we're, we're looking at, at Cabernet mostly. You know, although we, we are thinking at some point we may need to include a little bit more Merlot. And it would be wonderful to find another site that would be ideal for Chardonnay. 
But as you get above the fog line, it, it really becomes more challenging to, to find a cool enough spot to, to make sure you've got the chance to grow Chardonnay and maintain good acidity. And what we're seeing is that being lower down the mountain is much more ideal for that. Hey, hey Eric, we've, uh, even though we've moved on to the Peroni Merlot, there's still yeah. questions rolling in on the Chardonnay. So, <laughs> so, two, so quickly, two questions you could answer. One is the oak that we use for the Chardonnay. And, um, and then also talk a little bit about the age, the ageability of the Chardonnay. Well, you know, we've been making the Chardonnay from the same vines for forever. In the past, you know, before 2008, I think, uh, was the year we changed to the estate labeling. Before that, it was Santa Cruz Mountains Estate. Um, and, and that goes back to the 80s when, when you could find bottles of that production they still drink well today. I mean, the great thing about our site is that we have acidity helping with preserving the wine and, and also our, our real low tech winemaking approach being really more traditional Burgundian, we're not overly processing the wine. So we're not removing elements of ageability. And so our Chardonnays can drink really well for you know, 15 years. Even the estate, the Montebello is the one that can go even further out. And as oak goes, I mean, when I started here in 1994, we, we did really well with American oak for red wine, but it was really challenging to find barrels that were elegant enough of American oak to work with Chardonnay. So we were really using a lot of Char uh, uh, French oak barrels in that time. So we started to experiment in 1995 with some of our best American oak barrels, the burgundy versions, we brought into the cellar and none of those worked. It wasn't until 96 that we had this breakthrough with a cooperage that had just set up in uh, Kentucky. It was a Scottish family that had come over and bought a cooperage in uh, Louisville and began working with Appalachian Oak. They came out to California in 96 and rep, you know, showed us what they were about and, and what they had. And we brought a few of their barrels into our 96 vintage and in blind taste, really loved what they did. I mean, they, the quality of the flavor was as good as the best of the French that we were bringing into the cellar. And with that, we, we felt we, we had a good chance to move towards American oak. And with every vintage, we just brought more of their barrels in, bought less of the French, and then also began playing around with a couple other cooperages that were in that same vicinity around Louisville and their Appalachian oak barrels worked really well, as, as good as the Scottish family. And so it really turns out that the oak for Chardonnay, most of it is really coming from within that area of Kentucky, uh, Virginia, kind of in an area where the American oak uh, grows slow, the trees are, are under a lot more stress, the, the wood is tighter grain, and, and it just has a uh, a more elegant extraction in our Chardonnay. And the other thing about our Chardonnay is that we don't bring in so much new oak every year. That it could be as little as 5% new oak to maybe as much as 15%, depending on the year. So we really watch that new oak impact on the wine. And once the wine is assembled, then it goes into the oldest barrels of the cellar to finish off for the, the last five months it's gonna be in mostly neutral oak so that whatever new oak came in at assemblage over that five month period of time, it's gonna integrate nicely as we go to bottle. Because we're really, we're interested in making a Chardonnay that represents the beauty of the variety and, and of the Montebello site, not the artistry of barrel making. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, good. Okay, so, um... The uh, Dave, one of the one question that's coming out a little bit is if you could talk just not. I, I know sometimes these topics can you know could be an entire lecture uh, unto themselves, but just talk a little bit about the clones of vines that we're using for, especially the on the red side, the Merlot and the Cabernet Sauvignon, and uh, what and what we've learned about that over the years. Sure, uh, yes, so the, the very first Merlot brought in was, um, I kind of hate to say it, but a suitcase selection um, <laughs> that came via, via Mexico, of all things, um, France via Mexico. It's, uh, it's mixed, there's a lot of virus in it, 
Um, the, since then, uh, there's uh, this clean stock program at, at um, UC Davis Foundation Plant Services um, has a couple of the of that uh, selection cleaned up as separate clones. So there, that was kind of on the French side. The other, the, the Merlot that we really like that has a um, longer history in California is we call it the C clone. So it's SEE, the, the candy company. Um, they, they bought a vineyard in Napa in the 40s or 50s and um, had some old Merlot vines on there and um, that, that wood is out in the industry and, and that's, a, that's really nice. Merlot doesn't grow very vigorously so you want to make sure that it, you have a, a stronger growing clone um, and crop wise it can, it can yield much, much more than in some years that, than it can get ripe so we have to watch that. On the quickly on the Cabernet side, the, our oldest vines planted in in the in 1949 came from this little um, winery, actually not little, but a winery nursery a commune called Fountain Grove. That's just north of uh, Santa Rosa. Uh, the, they had a big round barn that they that was over 120 years old that burned down in the last um, fires, unfortunately. Um, but it was right there, just north of town. Uh, we have cleaned up that variety, so it's it's actually available to the rest of the industry now as the Fountain Grove Cabernet clone. A couple other ones that we really like um, is we call La Cuesta. It came from Woodside, this beautiful old old vineyard that is no more. It's all um, big homes, and, um, and that's also known in the industry as the Mount Eden clone because uh, uh, Martin Ray you know, got the budwood from the the um, uh, Rex, Rexford, Rixford brothers um, back in the, when he started his winery and then was using that as his Cabernet clone. That We love that one too. And then we've, we've experimented with a few others. Um, one that we really like is uh, called FPS 02. That's the Oakville clone. Even though it came from Sonoma, it, 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 Napa, uh, Napa grabbed its name. Uh, and then a, a couple of French clones that, that um, we, we like, uh, you just really have to watch watch them as far as yield and, and acidity, but um, yeah, I could go on, but I'll- uh, That's good though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, with, with Merlot, it, you really do have to watch the yields because it, it's the first to bud out, the first to bloom. Some, some years mother nature takes care of the yields by just sending a storm through during flower and set, and you know, you end up with a lot of shatter and not much yield. And in those vintages, you're going to get really intense, powerful Merlot. But if the vines have bloomed during really nice weather, you know, they can crank out a big crop and you then have to really go through and really watch it um, drop fruit and, and really watch uh, as we're harvesting and getting close to harvest, just the flavor development and the berries to pick it. And, try to come off the vine with, with fruit that's going to make really good, intense wine. Okay, I think it's probably time to move on to the Cabernet. Yeah. Um, and uh, and a after you've described the estate and talk about the estate, maybe you could also talk a little bit about the selection process between the estate and the Montebello. And yeah. uh, tell a us lot how of, you do that. Yeah, I mean, the estate, I mean, it's entirely from Montebello Vineyard. So here we have roughly 45 different parcels of the four Bordeaux varieties growing at uh, beginning at 1300 foot elevation and climbing the mountain to the top at 2700 feet. They're all mostly at kind of following the spine of the mountain and south facing. So within that, you've got all this rolling terrain. You've got different exposure, different depths of topsoil and where the vines hit limestone. You've got these little ravines where water can pool. So it's not a flat vineyard at all. Um, there's nothing uniform. And those 45 plots that make up our Bordeaux plantings, each one will ripen differently. And, and over the history of this vineyard, we've kind of zeroed in on the areas that are most likely to make Montebello are, are defined parcels. The rest then make the estate. The separation has a lot to do with just where they are located on the mountain. What is their water resources as the water is finding its way down the mountain? You get these little springs that pop up and feed the vine. So you end up with a lot of differences in vigor. 
So you've got high vigor sites where the berries are gonna be a little bit more juicy. The phenolics are gonna be softer, less tannins, versus the spots that are much more stressed those come from higher up the mountain where you've got shallow topsoil, the vines are older, they just have more of a struggle and the berries stay small and really concentrated. So every year we basically know where we're gonna start as far as the assemblage process. It's really with those parcels in the vineyard with history of making a state, that fruit comes in, it goes into the fermenters, we work those tanks really carefully keeping the tannins on the softer side because we really want this wine to be all about fruit, pleasure, appealing qualities with tannins. You know, even in this wine, there's still some good tannin, but it's like you can drink this wine right now. You, you're not going to need to sit and wait for the wine in the cellar to have 10 more years of bottle age before it's really ready to drink. You know, this is the cab we want our collectors and customers to be able to enjoy right now. So it really begins with just treating the fruit really delicately in the tanks as, as it's fermenting. And, and that's controlled through tasting every day in the morning before the crew comes in, going through every tank tasting to look at the tannin extraction. And from there I can decide, do we pump over or do we hold off? and just let it ferment to dryness, drain and press while we can hold back the tannin extraction. But then just like Montebello, we're relying on Merlot, some Franc, some Petit Verdot. So we're, we're really making this a classic left bank wine, but we're really selective of the pieces that we bring together so we make sure that the Merlot percentage is there to help really kind of surround the, the Cabernet tannins, you know, bring in that nice plush fruit, help with the approachability of the wine. And then Petit Verdot for just a little hit of darker berry fruit. The Franc is there for the aromatics. It's, it's probably the most aromatic of the Bordeaux varieties of really giving it some beautiful high tone quality of fruit. So it's carefully assembled just like Montebello. It's just, you know, a lot of the assemblage is already kind of predetermined by where the vineyard parcel is located and its history. So what would you say if you did a compare, sort of compare the aging profile for the estate Cabernet versus the Montebello? Well, it kind of hits that plateau sooner. So it's drinkable right now. It's going to continue to probably get to that plateau within about eight years and then hold, but then have a, a slow decay. So by 20 years out, it will probably be really at its, at its maximum. Whereas the Montebello, it, yeah. it takes longer to get to the plateau. You know, it's more like 10 to 15 years. And then once it's on the plateau, the Montebello can go out for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, depending on the vintage. And some vintages, you know, you can still go back to like 68 and drink that. It's, it's actually really glorious right now. But you wouldn't expect that of the estate just because we are really trying to make sure that the wine is it's all about pleasure and just the right amount of tannin to give it some nice texture. But we're not really trying to push this out for ageability. You know, it's on the label here, I'm, I'm saying it's it's about a 10 year period of time to drink and enjoy. So talk to also a little bit, Eric, about um, how, how best to approach these bottles from the standpoint of uh, opening, decanting, yeah. aerating, <laughs> drinking. Well, um, here's my little decanter from the lab here. I, <laughs> <laughs> I decanted these or poured them off at about two o'clock. Just, uh, you know, they're so young. They, they really do need that oxygen right now. Um, it, it, and right now they're, they're drinking extremely well. You know, the nose is really open. Uh, the fruit intensity is right there at the entry. So I, I definitely recommend always decanting, um, even an older vintage. I always, I always keep a decanter handy. It's always nice to, to really see the wine wake up and get some oxygen. 
Yeah, I think it, it's hard to do that with the Coravan. I mean, it's it's tough. I mean, you're not yeah. you're not properly decanting. So, I mean, I understand the importance of a Coravan for having just a small little taste to assess the bottle, but you know, it's not going to be the same as opening the cork, pouring it off, letting it open up and breathe. I think in general, you know, unless a Montebello is really fully mature and that there, you know, there are some that have reached that stage yeah. in, their, in their lifespan. But in general, even for, you know, Montebello's that maybe tw could be 20 or 25 years old, um, if they're not fully mature, a little bit of time in, in air exposure is not going to be a problem and may well be a, a, a benefit. So yeah. it, they tend not to be delicate flowers. They tend to, the Montebellos tend to be able to, to handle being opened and have a little bit of air. Uh, even the older vintages, uh, like I said, unless you've really I mean, got you it. you gotta go back to like the yeah. mid sixties to get a vintage that it's basically pull the cork, decant for sediment and then pour and drink. And, and drink, enjoy. right. Yeah. Um, but as you get into the 70s and, and certainly by the 80s, there's vintages that really are not delicate at all. They, they can yeah. sit there. The oxygen helps kind of release a lot of really wonderful aromatics and the wines just kind of blossom in the glass. Good. Yeah, that was, we've had a couple of questions about, about decanting and the age and when to when yeah. to drink. So that's great. That's helpful. And, and we do have that on our website. You can actually go and see the drinking, you know, for each vintage of Montebello, kind of where they are, whole drink, um, where they are in their drinkability. Yeah, and I, I think um, not only do we have the the our recommendations, but also we we have at, we provide access to. Uh, people's tasting notes, and we have a lot of uh, pretty pretty knowledgeable consumers who write good notes. And I often myself will look at some of those to get a sense of how the wine is drinking. If they pulled the cork on an older Montebello, and they'll describe what they did with it, how how long they let it sit, when they tasted it, how did the how did the wine evolve in the glass over time? And I think if if you look at that, you, it'll help give you an idea for your own cellar and your own wines how best to enjoy them. So. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And so the, the other thing I do for this wine over Montebello, Montebello, you know, it goes into brand new oak every year, 18 months is usually enough for it to really kind of hit its perfect moment for bottling. This wine, just to kind of ensure that enough tannins have been shed before bottling, I often go through a second summer. So it often approaches two years of bottle age or barrel age before bottling. And then once in bottle, it has a good nine months or so of bottle age before release. And the cork is, you know, very similar to an oak stave. It's, it's going to let the wine continue to evolve and age. And it just really helps the wine just reach a, a point, a good point of drinkability by letting it spend more time in barrel. Yeah, but that's... I do back off on new oak. I, you know, we'll use maybe 60% new barrels. And again, a lot of the barrels we, we're using are mostly from the region of Kentucky, you know, where it, it just seems to work really well with our mountain fruit. It just brings the level of, of sensuousness in the wine up. Okay, I think we should move on to the final wine in the lineup, the Klein uh, yeah. Cabernet. And uh, Dave, maybe talk start by talking a little bit about the Klein or Jim Samir Ranch and its history and, um, you know, sort of what makes it uh, interesting. You've talked about on the Chardonnay side, the fog, but for the red, the red varietals that we grow there, tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, yes. So the, the Klein Ranch or the or Jim Samir for, for a long time, Ridgeites, they know this as the Jim Samir Ranch. And we, yeah. we still make a Jim Samir Zinfandel. Um, so label it as Jim Samir from the ranch. It, it's our um, probably, of, well, of the four um, ranches on the hill, it has the most varied terrain. So it goes from about 1,300 feet or so all the way up to just under uh, 2,000 feet. So it goes, it transitions right through that, the fog layer, the inversion layer. The um, the Cabernet, we have a couple of Cabernets down at the lowest, um, Cabernet, Cabernet block and a Merlot block at the lowest elevations. And they tend to come in 
a little bit earlier in the in the harvest at least the cabernet does and it also uh, because of that um, the cool mornings it has more of um, what we call the, the well the vegetal flavor um, of the purzines in the cabernet so in fact um, we all have to get that a little bit riper so that there is a we, we don't mind a little bit of those purzines um, we call it good green um, yeah. but we don't want it to be overwhelming on the wine so um, the upper blocks of, of, at closer to 2,000 feet have none of that. In fact, they, they can be very powerful wines. Um, the, the acid levels on, on, the, on the grapes on, on this ranch tend to be a little bit lower than what we see up on top. And that helps too. It's a very good blending. It, it's funny because some years, um, the, the middle sections of, our, of, the, of the ranch, say the of, um, Torre or now the top of Rooston, uh, tend to be the sweet spot. Sometimes it's all the way up at Peroni, and sometimes it's down at Jimson, mm -hmm. where the lower elevation Cabernet. So it's it, having that variability is really nice um, because you can it, it spreads out the picking, which is great because we don't have a huge crew. Um, but it also helps with the with each year you can find where that sweet spot is and then and really hone in on on that. Um, and we're lucky; it's it's we lease this property. Um, Ridge, the Ridge Partners back in the in the 70s actually worked with the um, Jim, the owners of Jim Samara to um, plant grapes uh, for them, with the express purpose of, um, of of Ridge buying the the fruit. And then in 1995, we took out a 30 or so year lease on the property. Um, the the first grapes that that um, we we made from Jim uh, Jim Samara or the Klein was also, was actually the Zinfandel. So these were pre-prohibition, a little pre-prohibition block that the, um, that uh, uh, Almano Homem, who was the branch manager for a long time, that ranch manager resurrected from, um, you know, having not been pruned for 10 or so years and decided to sell the grapes to the hippies on the hill and became great friends with David Benyon and uh, the first winemaker and then by the by the time the um, with Paul coming on in '69 in the '70s there was a res, a little bit of money to do some planting and that's when we the the Ridge Partners planted out the um, Peroni Vineyard and then also started on Jim Samara and then expanded the acreage um, rapidly and was and we've always been buying the fruit from there and it's it's been a great relationship that's um, mm -hmm. really fun 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 uh, beautiful property absolutely. Oh, I love it. Yeah, I absolutely love Jim Zimmer Ranch. You know, the Chardonnay, I mean, the heart of our Chardonnay is there at that, that ranch. And then those old Zinn vines and just the beautiful wine that comes off of there. If you taste it against any of the other Zins, it'd be hard to even say it's Zinfandel because it's so, so dark and so, I mean, it's 100% Zinn, but just so saturated, acidic, it ages forever. I mean, it's a really exotic Zinfandel. And then, of course, the, the Bordeaux varieties. So we've got Merlot growing there, uh, which often goes into the estate Merlot, which we're not tasting today, but a, a, por a portion of that is a separate bottling. And then Cabernet. So uh, the higher blocks of Cabernet growing at Jim Zimmer are often what we'll bring into the Montebello blend itself. This being at the lowest elevation for the Klein, um, that is the historic vineyard selection and, and it tends to be from that same block every year. Uh, I'm just in fact writing the, the 2018 label right now and it's the same block, but half of production because the yields in 18 were just decimated. But in 17, we, we made, uh, uh, looks like 19 barrels, which is a healthy amount. Uh, in 2018, it's down to 13 barrels. But, so, Eric, yeah, do you remember the 97 Jim Samara? Oh, absolutely, cab? yeah, that was, yeah. so, oh man. So this one, this this reminds me of that. It, it does. Has the exuberance of fruit and the, the amount of tannin that it has, it's just enough. Um, I, I can't wait for it in about 10 I know, years, it's, it's gonna, gonna age so well, I think. I mean, there's there's this black olive, I mean, the, the kind of the trademark flavors of a, a Jim Zamir cab or what we now call Klein, is it, it smells of the forest. You've got the chaparral, the bay, all the trees that surround that block are really kind of amplified in this glass along with the beautiful Cabernet quality of fruit, the, 
the blackberry cassis, but then you have those underlying hints of, of forest and, and kind of dried brush and chaparral. To me, it's a really exotic wine. What's interesting is this is 100% Cabernet. So this is a little bit of a segue into what you guys are gonna do next week, which is to look at the individual components that go into the estate and, and the Montebello, um, each varietal and what each of those varietals bring to the blend. And I think in a way, this, this is an interesting example too of just seeing what the Cabernet by itself does in the glass and uh i think it's you know it's delicious yeah, i mean you can see i mean just how serious a wine it is mm -hmm. you know and then even the tannin structure it's it's quite you know it's firm yep. you know and if you were to take the merlot and blend with it and then you have montebello <laughs> no <laughs> not quite <laughs> montebello is a much more complex wine i mean it's made up of generally 22 to 28 different parcels growing higher up the mountain. You know, this, this Jim Zemer is the lower, lowest part of the Montebello property at 1300 feet. So it's gonna get hit by summertime fog. It's gonna bud out earlier just because it is lower down in the valley. So it benefits from that kind of warmer temperatures of springtime to bud out earlier. As a result, it's generally the first Cabernet parcel to come off the, for the vintage. And it's one that I really look at. So every year, you know, you've got various, uh, you know, differences of, of the growing season. So this is kind of my canary in the coal mine block where I look at how the fruit is extracting during fermentation. Is it a tannic year or is it a low tannin year? I can really look at this block and kind of get a feel for just where the vintage overall will be going and how I should be treating the rest of the fruit from the mountain. So it's a wonderful block to have. I mean, it gives me that, that early indication of, of what to expect for the fruit off Montebello. So I think we have one, one question that came in actually before we even started the, uh, the, uh, the panel discussion, which I think is kind of a nice question to, to end on. And this is more about kind of your individual passions and what you really, what, what's your favorite thing about the job that you do for Ridge? So, so, uh, so maybe uh, Eric, we'll start with you and then we'll finish up with Dave, okay? Yeah, for me, I mean, it, it seems like everything I do, I, I'm really passionate about. I mean, from working with Dave during harvest, sampling grapes, really, seeing the vintage come together and how it ferments, pressing off. It's like a game every year of like figuring out mother nature. You, you can figure out trends of like how much rain you have, how warm it has it been that summer. You know, I've been here long enough so I can kind of think, oh, it's gonna be just like this one vintage, but yet it could be totally different. So it's the mystery of, of winemaking, how, how the wines come together ultimately and how you cannot approach it with a recipe. It's never gonna be a recipe here. Um, and that's what keeps it so mystical and interesting. And every vintage is gonna be something totally different. And it's like, you know, in these times that we're facing right now, so the vines are growing, you know, we're gonna make a vintage. They know no, no, nothing that's going on in the world right now. They're, job is to put out a crop, we're going to harvest it, make a wine, and it's going to be great. You know, we'll get through it. And then, you know, 10 years down the road, remember, oh, what a crazy year 2020 has been. <laughs> yep. It will yeah. certainly be a vintage that we won't forget. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. Dave, how about you? Well, you know, I, well, I, I love harvest and the <laughs> excitement and it's like this culmination of all the work that you've put in. You know, my favorite time of year is um, what just passed. It's um, pruning because that's where that's where you kind of set it all up. So you have these these vines. You're basically trying to make a a, um, a species that wants to grow up in trees and have lots and lots and lots of clusters with only one or two berries on it, so the birds will eat it. Um, to <laughs> to produce something that you want uh, and uh, kind of manipulating it a little bit to and and prune, you know, to to get it so that you can get the, the right quality fruit um, and, and how, and to make it easier for you to yeah, kind of manage it. And so, and
and that starts with pruning. So that's that's really fun. And if there's an art to it, especially when you cane prune, which we do here, especially when you're cane pruning Cabernet Sauvignon, which is a big kind of big growing strong vine. And so you have to it takes takes a takes somebody that's new in the vineyard. I, it's about five years before I really trust their pruning. So um, <laughs> it's, 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 uh, that, that's, my, that's the fun part for me. Fantastic. Well, that's great. I think we're, uh, we've come to the end of our hour together. So uh, I hope everyone watching has enjoyed uh, the, uh, the interaction here and the information from Eric and from Dave. And we've had a lot of really good questions. We couldn't get to all of them. Uh, but uh, we appreciate your, your engagement. Uh, lots of nice comments on the chat as well. Um, we hope you might be able to join us again next week. As I mentioned, uh, that we're going to focus next week on the individual varietals that make up the Montebello vineyard and are used in creating the, the estate and the Montebello wines. Um, you know, when, 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 when we're open and we get to have people come to visit us, I think the component tasting that we do each year for the Montebello is one of the most popular tastings that we do. Um, and uh, so hopefully we can recreate in part that uh, same experience for those of you who maybe don't even live close to us or have never had a chance to come and visit us uh, live to, to talk more about each of these different varietals and, and what they do. So sign up for us next week. Um, I, I should mention that we do have, and, and Eric was, he, he sort of pointed out that we actually had a pretty good production of the Klein uh, Cabernet. And uh, so we do have some uh, supply of the historic vineyard series wines available for those of you who've never uh, purchased or experienced uh, tasting them before, I would encourage you to, to buy some. Uh, so all the wines that we've looked at today are, are available. Um, we are, we are, although our tasting rooms are closed, our website is still in business and, uh, uh, so we, we encourage you to, uh, to, to uh, stock up on a few bottles if you haven't done so already. So with that, I want to thank uh, our panelists. I want to thank everyone who uh, took the time to join us and send questions and, and chat and participate. And we'll see you all again here next Thursday at 4 o'clock. All right. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>